So on behalf of Outright, I'm very honored to welcome you all to this webinar on legal gender recognition and the right to self-determination. This webinar is part of a month long campaign called Celebrating Legal Gender Recognition. And throughout this month, we are rolling out a series of videos of people who have been able to access legal gender recognition and change their gender marker based on self-determination in their country. And we're celebrating those countries and the people who've been able to take advantage of that opportunity and the way in which it's changed their lives. The emphasis on celebrating in this campaign on legal gender recognition is intentional. We spend a lot of time in our movements focusing on what's going wrong. And identifying problems is definitely an essential element of advocacy, but when we don't talk about what's going right, there are at least two drawbacks that I can think of. One is that we can very easily lose momentum. We get bogged down in the negative, especially if we're being attacked for our work, which we know is a problem for those of us who are working on the rights of trans and trans diverse people. And it's important for us as a movement to keep in mind that it's actually pretty remarkable that in just over a decade, going back to 2012, we've gone from zero countries to around 17 that have gender identity laws that are based largely on self-determination. And we have to celebrate that success to keep ourselves going and to motivate other countries to add themselves to the list. And I think the second reason we need to focus on the positive and celebrate is that if we don't share success stories, we don't convince the general public that our movements are creating positive change and that there actually are alternative narratives and alternative policies that are better for everyone. So if, for instance, we only talk about combating the anti-trans movement or fighting back against the anti-gender movement, we're articulating what we're against and not what we're for. And that doesn't bring people along in our struggle. So we're talking about celebrating today and we're talking about what we are for. And what are we for? Well, at Outright, and we think for others aligned with us in global LGBTIQ, feminist and human rights movements, that we are all for trans liberation. We're all for gender liberation. And we're for the right for everyone to be themselves. We're for human dignity and we're for self-realization. And what is one way to adva advance all of these beautiful things that it's hard for anyone rational to disagree with? One way to do that is through legal gender recognition based on self-determination. So the outcome that we want, gender liberation, determines the policy that we're going to push for. Legal gender recognition as a tool to achieve this gender liberatory world that we want that not only trans people want, that not only queer people want, but that everyone should want if they believe that your life outcomes should not be determined by your anatomy. So one core belief of Outright that comes with this Celebrating Legal Gender Recognition campaign and a belief that we want all of our allies, including straight cis people to take on board is that trans people free everyone. A legal regime that forces people to be identified for life by and to carry around official documents reflecting a sex marker showing what doctors or midwives found between our legs at birth and in which our opportunities and life outcomes are predetermined based on that sex marker is a regime that prevents everyone from full and free development of their personality. We should all question our gender and we should all be the authors of our own lives. And trans people by demanding gender identity laws based on self-determination give us all greater self-determination over our own identities and our gender journeys. And of course, there are human rights issues at stake here as well, concrete human rights issues, right? Um, having a gender marker that doesn't match your presentation creates daily struggles and discrimination when you have to go to a doctor, to a police checkpoint, to a job interview. And for all of these reasons, Outright invites all human rights organizations and everyone working against gender-based discrimination to get on board and support legal gender recognition as a way to end discrimination very concretely. So on that note, I have the honor of turning over to Ricky Nathanson, my brilliant colleague who will introduce our two extraordinary panelists and moderate this discussion. Ricky is the senior advisor of Outright's Global Trans Program based in the Washington DC area. She is an expert on Outright's work supporting the efforts of legal gender recognition and strengthening the trans and intersex movements globally. Ricky brings a wealth of experience in global trans advocacy and a long track record in business management and the nonprofit sector. She founded the first trans vet and trans specific organization in Zimbabwe and was instrumental in forming the Southern Africa Trans Forum. She is famously known for having stood her ground and winning a civil suit against the government and police of Zimbabwe 
after her unlawful arrest and detention in 2014. And Ricky is inspired to right the wrongs that trans and LGBTIQ people face, having experienced the cruelty and dangers they endure from being seen as different from the norm firsthand. So Ricky, thank you for moderating this panel, for being in the struggle, and I turn over to you. And thank you, Neela, for those, those wonderful words. Um, I will just, I'll jump straight into introducing my panelists. Uh, we, you know, we, we're running short of time. Um, I have two fabulous um, panelists that were so generous with their time by agreeing to speak on this, on this webinar this morning. And joining us this morning, we have Antonia Moreira, who is from Brazil. Um, Antonia is a writer, human rights advocate, and impact strategist. She's currently the Director of Operations and Project Coordinator at uh, Brazil's award-winning Atelier Transmoras Association, focused on the economic empowerment of trans people. In 2023, she was a fellow of the Human Rights Advocates Program at Columbia University in New York City, and I was I had the pleasure of meeting her firsthand when she was in, the, in New York um, last year. Um, we also have Oscar Noel Fitzpas Fitzpatrick, excuse me, who is the consultant to both the Global Youth and Sex Characteristics Program at Ilga World. He is a multidisciplinary activist, artist, facilitator, and researcher. Oscar obtained his BA in Drama and Theatre Studies from Trinity College in Dublin. And he his, master, his MA in New Media and Digital Culture from the University of Amsterdam. He is additionally conducting ongoing research and advocacy in the intersecting areas of digital citizenship and digitally mediated anti-gender violence. So welcome to both of you. Um, so to, we'll be having a discussion this morning really basically around, you know, um, hopefully the people on this call have seen, have been following our campaign. They've seen the videos that, that are posted on our website. Where we've spoken, as Neela said, we want to really celebrate um, the um, the wins we've, we, we have, with the gains we've, we've managed to achieve by accessing legal gender recognition, um, by self-determination, meaning we are employing methods in, in both your countries and the other countries that we've spoken to around the world, whereby trans people are given the opportunity to, to determine how they want to be seen, how they want their gender to be, to be determined legally in the circumstances in which they live without having to go through any pathologizing um, methods of like medical examinations, um, witness testimonies, and so on and so forth. <clears throat> Pardon me. So let's just start with you, Oscar. If you can sort of just walk through what the process was like in, or what it is like in, in, in Ireland, and then by comparison, I can hand over to you, Antonia, after Oscar goes go with that question. Absolutely, thank you. Thank you for that great introduction um, from everyone. It's it's really great to, to be here to talk about this. So sort of in the context of Ireland, let's set the scene. Um, in Ireland, homosexuality was decriminalized in 1993. So that's sort of our first movement in the Sogiesque world of Ireland, which is quite a young country. In 2015, we passed the Gender Recognition Act, which, as you say, allows for gender by self-determination. That process in Ireland at the moment is there's sort of a three tiered system. So if you're under the age of 16, unfortunately, there is no access to legal gender recognition in any way, shape or form. You have to wait until you're between the ages of 16 and 17 or 18 plus. For those who are aged between 16 and 17, it is possible to change your gender by self-declaration with the support of the family court system. It's just an additional extra step. Realistically, this makes it logistically impossible for a lot of uh, trans and non-binary young people to access legal gender recognition. So in reality, we sort of sit in that third category of gender by self-declaration for those over the age of 18. Um, we're allowed to, in Ireland, you can have a binary gender recognition, so we don't have any non-binary recognition we don't have provisions for people under a certain age. It, for me, what that meant was in 2016, I was able to walk into a solicitor's office with a witness who was a friend, um, and together we signed one piece of paper and then posted it into the Irish postal system. That was a little bit delayed. It took about two weeks for me to receive an updated birth certificate, gender recognition certificate. Now it also allows you to change your name at the same time. At the time, I had to change my name by deed poll. Um, which was an additional cost. Now in Ireland, it's possible to do both at the same time. You also no longer have to do, and um, there was a two years of use rule on the name change that we no longer have to do. 
and um, the legislation has yet to be updated to reflect that practice but in practice that is how it goes for me it was incredibly simple it cost i think the sum of 12 euro to get my uh, to get it stamped by the solicitor and then sent on um, and as i'm sure we'll discuss a little bit later on for a document that is so life-changing and so life-affirming it was incredibly straightforward for me to access this and i'd like to hope that again as we'll discuss later on that we can open that up to more people because in ireland while we do have a very good system there's always more to to come and more people to be able to be included yeah oscar um antonia well, hi everyone. Thank you, Ricky, for this invitation. I'm thrilled to be here to know Oscar. Um, as I said in the video of the campaign, in Brazil, we have access to changing our gender marks and name since 2018 by a Supreme Court decision. Um, it's very, not peculiar, but it's part of the history of Brazil, uh, more progressive rights, usually don't go, especially LGBTQ rights, don't pass the Congress. They never pass um, any law to protect us, for instance. So it's it's not strange um, to see this, this change by uh, being made by the Supreme Court. Um, the process before, as you mentioned, was similar to other countries. So this pathologization, we need to, uh, years of psychologists, someone testing that you were uh, trans for real and you were uh, able and knowing uh, everything that would change if you change your gender marks. But after this Supreme Court decision in 2018, you no longer need to do this kind of uh, torture process, you know. Um, so we can do this easily in terms of process in the civil registry. Uh, we can talk more about the challenges after. Uh, it's not so cheap as in Ireland, unfortunately. Um, in, in, in dollars, around 100 to $300 by, by numbers of today. Uh, and it depends a lot of where you are, where this trans individual is. So if I'm living in a city different from where I was born, uh, the, it will be more expensive. So um, what we are seeing now is lots of initiatives from mm -hmm. the private sector or nonprofits, especially working to provide this kind of service to trans people in vulnerability because it's not um, easy for everyone to have this, this money and to invest. Uh, although it's important, it's still expensive. Um, just as a follow-up question to you, Antonia. So mm -hmm. um, it sounds like it was, it was quite a difficult process for you to to um, to manage to succeed in getting your um, your gender markers changed and getting your name changed. And listening to your video and the interview that, that you and I did previously, um, what assistance did you have, or or is it can any regular um, um, person be able to do it in Brazil? Because it sounds like it, it can be quite a difficult situation, a difficult process to 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 manage. Yeah, there are a lot of layers. I was uh, gracefully helped by Casa Chama, is a, a NGO in São Paulo. São Paulo is a uh, is a center, economic center of Brazil, so it's easier than other uh, parts of the country. They helped me connecting connecting with a lawyer, although it's not a it's not it's not a, a judicial process, but the lawyer helped me with the different sites I need to go to take different documents. Uh, and as a, we are talking about public sectors, the sites are not good. Uh, you can access easily by mobile phone. So it's another uh, thing because most people, at least in Brazil, have access to internet only by their, by their cell phones and um, mobile internet. So they don't have access to computers that they can access this uh, kind of public um, public websites. Uh, so for me, it was easier because I had this opportunity with Casa Chama, the connection with a lawyer and with a, 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 a godfather, maybe they call this, which paid for the process. Um, we have other initiatives uh, to help people to 
give every link they need to go through and help them to do this by themselves, but they should need to, um, to pay for this. And depending on, on, on the, on the geography, the price will be different. So for me especially, it was easier because I had this, this support, but the agenda now is how can we change this? Because Katashama is an NGO. It's funded by donors, people, and a lot of money is going through this uh, process. And one strange aspect in Brazil uh, is that the civil registry is not a public uh, sector, it's private. So some people are receiving money, are being benefited by this process in Brazil. And we know who, who we are, who, who these people are. Uh, the civil register in Brazil is a holdover of the monarchy. So uh, it's a very peculiar and strange process in these terms. Did right. that answer your question, Ricky? Yes, it did, yes. It sounds as though, so even though, I mean, it's it, we, cel we celebrate that, that, that this law does exist and that trans people are now able to, to, to access um, the, this facility of being able to change their, their gender markers to, to align with, you know, who, the, who they say they are, there's still a lot of work to be done in as far as smoothing out the administrative process and um, addressing things like the cost and the accessibility to every trans person in Brazil, who's not, especially those that are not in, in Sao Paulo or, or, or Rio or, or some of the, some of the, of, of the, of the bigger cities. Um, sure. And returning to you, um, Oscar, you mentioned briefly earlier on about the, the under 18s, the under 16s, um, and the work that you're currently doing to see how best you can um, um, make it more accessible in your case in Ireland for people who are who are deemed minors to be able to access um, legal gender recognition um, in contrast to Antonia who you know who is who is, is a more generic um, for for all trans people maybe let's speak to what's going on there what's happening what the go more in detail as to what the situation is <clears throat> explain what the ramifications are for 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 uh, people that are going to um, trying to change the gender markers that are under eight, under 16 or under 18. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. So there's, as I said, there's sort of a, a, a diversity of systems that we have in Ireland because of a variety of reasons. Um, currently, if you're aged between 16 and 17, and that's sort of the bracket for medical consent in this country as well, so you can sort of make a lot of larger decisions about your life, private life and your medical life as as you turn 16 and 17 in this country. Currently, if you want to as a 16 or 17 year old to change your gender marker. It requires you to use the form that we already have for the standard gender recognition certificate. And then you also need to attend a family court system with one or both of your guardians. If both of your guardians are available, they have to be there, which can cause its own problem where you have one guardian who is very on board and on side and maybe one who isn't, if you have any guardians who are supportive at all. So you will then need to go to this family court system and get an exemption um, from the judge, which basically says, you're allowed to change your gender marker with the exemption of being under 18 that will allow you to go through it in reality people don't really have the capacity to engage in that process from the perspective of parental support or guardian support and then also just from the paperwork angle it's a little bit of additional work where it will probably take maybe a year or more for this to happen so if you're already 17 and it's going to take a year you may as well just wait until you're 18 when the process is a little bit smoother and then under the age of 16, there's absolutely no provision for legal gender recognition. And that's obviously separate to the medical system that we engage with in this country. Ireland is the lowest ranking in Europe of uh, transgender healthcare. Um, but in terms of our legal gender recognition, that's the current status. In two, uh, since the gender recognition was passed in 2015, there's been a review process and there's been an ongoing period of consultation and review with NGOs in Ireland and with trans individuals and activists who are engaging in the sector. There's been two main recommendations that have come through this process of review. The first one being to introduce um, uh, introduce a system for those between the ages of 16 and 17, and to also introduce provisions for people under the age of 16 and to see what that could look like. The main recommendation is for the 16 to 17 bracket. And then secondarily, the recommendation is to include uh, provisions for non-binary gender markers as well. Currently, we have no system for that. There's no recognition of it. Um, 
So those two pieces are sort of the main next steps that we have. The review, uh, those recommendations came out in 2018 and they're sort of impetus from the government to try and push forward for that review and that consultation process before 2025. So the goal will be that by 2025, we will have a revision to the gender recognition system where we have provisions for people between the ages of 16 and 17 and provisions for people to have non-binary gender recognition. Comparatively, I think to Brazil, um, the process of obtaining this legal gender recognition in the government of Ireland has been uh, smooth-ish. I think that usually we anticipate quite a lot of resistance and um, requests for revision and sort of um, negative actors to enter the space and try and argue against what we're trying to push forward. In reality, there was a huge amount of um, really solid work done by people for many, many years and the, the gender recognition bill passed without a lot of commotion. Uh, it also happened around the same time as the Irish um, marriage equality referendum. So the two pieces sort of came in around the same the same year. And there was a, there was a little bit more focus from the negative actors on the marriage equality referendum, because I think it was a little bit more divisive to be able to talk to people about that. So the gender recognition bill sort of passed through with not a lot of uh, resistance. So my con the concern, I think, and the, the, the mood generally right now is with this new revision coming up and sort of the change that we've seen in the landscape of talking about trans rights and gender recognition since 2016. I think it's a pretty straightforward to say there's been a rise in anti-gender and anti-trans movements and there's been a lot more funding going into those spaces. They're a little bit more mobilized and unified than they were in 2016. That paired with the misinformation machine of the internet is sort of causing concern in our plans to review the Gender Recognition Act. And our proximity to the UK does make it quite difficult as well, because they have their own sort of internal issues with their review of the gender recognition system and the gender healthcare system. So we are moving forward and um, we're moving forward with the hope of changing these two elements and moving beyond those two elements and to, to create a more inclusive legislation for everyone. But there's definitely a tentative uh, stepping forward with this, knowing that we're sort of going to be opening the door to this debate all over again. Great. If you don't mind me asking a follow-up question, um, so do you have any definitive strategies that you are employing in able to, you know, if you don't mind sharing, if it's not too much information to ask, um, yeah. you know, maybe it could it could help other other countries, other activists in in other situations around the world to see what strategies um you're using or. or to get to where you are and then how do you hope to moving forward um when you think when you look at um introducing the the non-binary gender markers and the 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 under 16 under 18 gender markers what strategies are you using particularly in light of of the adversaries that we're facing now, the anti anti rights movement, what's happening, what's happening in, in the UK, um, all this this craziness I'm seeing online now, especially on 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 YouTube, of of they're pushing all this these detransition stories and how they are saying you know those of us that that have transitioned are crazy and there's many people that are detransitioning. De so how are we, um, you know, what strategies are you using to counter those sort of uh, negative? Um, yeah, it's, it's a really good question, which is quite, it's a tricky one to balance. Essentially, the mood that we go with is to try and base everything that we're using in facts, in statistics, in research. We ground ourselves in reality in ways that our detractors don't necessarily have. Um, mainly what we mean by that is we use public consultation forums in Ireland to do a lot of our revisions to our laws. So we'll invite members of the public and uh, issue experts, whether they be trans or in other ways uh, educated about our issues, they're invited to come and do these public consultations. And then they tend to go into a system of deba debate in our houses of parliament. Um, in those spaces, uh, we tend to try and focus more on facts and the people that we will be on side with and sort of the people that are on our team, as it were, we provide them with a huge amount of the resources and information and wealth of knowledge that we have about the implications of legal gender recognition and the well-being of trans people and how those two things come really well hand in hand. What we have to do to circumnavigate the issues of anti-gender movements and the anti-rights actors that we're engaging with is to meet them where they're at, I guess, is the phrase that we use. Um, if people are talking in terms of detransition statistics or they will mention terms of detransition, we will then bring up the statistics of detransition and also the reality of caring for people who exist in a detransitioning state or who go through the flux of gender transition. Because honestly, I think that the 
as we often say in these circles, the, those are the first people to be sort of brought up by our anti-gender movement as the pillar of why we shouldn't do this. When in reality, those people aren't being supported by these negative actors. In reality, it's the trans community that are often supporting these people and ensuring that they are uh, cared for and their trauma is addressed. So the reality of how we try and navigate the difficult and dangerous situation is to talk in terms of fact and reality. We're not trying to legislate against people's thoughts. We're not trying to legislate against people's beliefs and actions. We're trying to make sure that everyone has access to the equality that the Irish state has been founded on. Um, the part of our constitution is that Ireland is supposed to love all of her children equally. And part of that includes our trans community and supporting every element of gender diversity. Um, there's a triple concern in terms of the youth element where we start talking about gender affirming uh, gender affirming healthcare or uh, social practices for people under the age of uh, 16 and sort of when we get into the very youth element of it all um, the reality is that these things will take so long for the process to be developed and the consultations to be held that i am assured that they will be safe and reasonable and based in fact and based in medical support and based in all of the very good holistic elements of uh, advocacy that we all know and um, and i think bringing those things so bringing that wealth of knowledge and the bolstering of your facts and all the research that we have that makes this a little bit less complicated um there's only so much that the negative actors can do in terms of sharing misinformation we can always try and rebuttal where we can um and then it's other than that, it's an element of public um, public education. We're trying to that's sort of the bigger battle. It's one thing to get the, the political people on side and the governments on side. But trying to guess the public opinion can be a little bit more complicated because, as we know, fear mongering and misinformation is a little bit louder than reality and peaceful facts. So there is a it's a careful it's a careful dance. Um, but we also, as you know, can't just throw out our uh, our detractors. We can't just pretend they don't exist. Have to acknowledge them and have to work around them. Right. And Antonio, what what strategies um, did you use in in Brazil? And currently, you know, you still do, as you said earlier on, we, there are problems that you're still facing um, in accessing in all the trans people accessing uh, legal gender recognition in Brazil. What sort of strategies are you looking at to overcome the? The lack of access and all these administrative hurdles that you are that you are seeing in in Brazil. Sure, uh, I believe there are different levels. Um, from what I can do from my from my perspective, uh, first is trying to partnership with uh, companies or other the, the public ministry um, departments or areas or sectors that can help us fund this this change. So. Uh, instead of an NGO that suffers lack of funds for forever, uh, have this process. We try sort of tr try to uh, get allies with the proper funding to do this um, in in the basic level. So we have some successful cases. Um, we have this uh, ESG vibe that people, this agenda, this market, this, this market agenda. Um, so a lot of companies interested in DEI, diversity and equity inclusion are promoting this kind of thing for their employees and some of them to um, people of the community, even though they are not hired. Uh, in the macro uh, level, I would say um, that everything is connected. When talking about impact, for instance, when we have the access to this to the our names and gender in our documents we are even more, more susceptible to vote and right now we have two trans congress women in brazilian uh, brazil congress and of course this, this, this is not the only reason the whole society is going through a change somehow but Two weeks ago, Erica Hilton proposed a law in the Congress. As I said, never a, a, a law uh, focused on our rights was passed before, but she's there proposing um, to make this change free, available for everyone in the country. Um, so this is also an opportunity. I know that Bahia is a state in our Eastern Brazil have this process for free. Um, and we are sort of trying to know how we can foster this to other states as well. And one thing that is, is, is kind of a, a strategy 
to give visibility to non-binary people is to have the, the non-binary in documents as well. Six states in Brazil allow this already. Um, of course, it's a challenging because it changed the whole structure because we will not now start to talk about uh, the retirement process that is basically binary, right? Um, but I, I believe this is not my strategy, but the movement, as I can notice and I can uh, perceive, is somehow trying to give visibility to this, this community and use these as an opportunity to mix of these structures, you know, these binary structures that exist in society. Um, so I, I believe this is that different levels on, on the tactical level, trying to partnership, create partnerships with companies, departments, public departments, and in the macro, trying to change the law. Because as I said, this process, our right is uh, filling someone's pocket and it shouldn't be like that. Yes, yeah, so stay with you, Antonia. Um, let's just move to you as an individual. Can you sort of just give us a, like very briefly, what, what was your life like before you were able to, to change your gender marker and what benefits have you achieved um, after being able to do so? Now we really need to speak to the celebrating the need for us to have um, self-determined legal gender recognition. Sure. Well, Ricky, um, one thing that I'd like to, 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 to bring here in this conversation uh, before the, changing my 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 name, changing my gender marks and documents, I had access to the social name. I don't know if you use this in in, in, in an English world. Explain. 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 Yeah. Uh, is our name before we change our gender marks? Okay. Our okay. social name, the name Bye. we are called by, right? Yes. Yeah. But five years before the Supreme Court decision uh, in Dilma Rousseff's presidents, we were able to change our documents to add the social name. So it's still male, the dead right. name behind, right. yeah. but but with this social name. Uh, and, and for a lot of people, trans people, this transition period before, you, uh, that's my name, that's my last name, my new yeah. last name, yeah. it's, it's, it's huge, you know, like people change sometimes. And in Brazil, through this process of this legal gender recognition process, you can only change one time. So the social oh. chain, so the social name, sorry, was important for me and other people as well to experiment somehow, being, being myself and reflecting this, although not completely in the documents. Um, and it was very important for me because I feel somehow recognized. And of course, violence too can happen. If you have your documents, it doesn't mean that you won't be expelled from a bathroom, a public bathroom. It still happens, but somehow gives us a, a sense of justice. You know, if something like this happened, like if one be like that. Like I, I would, we, we would do something. I have my community aware of this too. So it gave me this kind of power and sense of community that of course has its limits, but at least I am protected somehow, not by the law, by, but by knowing that I, I am this person, you know, and no one can say uh, against this, although they try all the time override our rights. So um, I don't know, this, this, this feeling that I can notice in, in my sisters, my brothers, um, somehow exists. Uh, we exist, you know, and we, we have our rights, although people try to, to override them. Um, and of course, when I received this, my, the first card with my name was very emotional because I don't know, people don't need to call my name or to take my card and know that I am uh, something else, you know? Yeah. Uh, it's less it's less confused for me on a daily basis in this yeah. practical things too. Yeah. 
And moving to you, Oscar, I mean, um, what benefits have you seen, if any, after having changed? And why is it so important to you that for this process to be legal? Yeah, so there's, I was really uh, lucky to be able to change my uh, my gender in the first year of uh, legal gender recognition being available. So in 2016, the practice started actually being uh, being available. I was 19, um, so I was able to go with my friend and get this piece of paper. The immediate change that took place in my life was pretty profound. I was at the time trying to get work. I was trying to find a job um, and it was incredibly difficult to get past the application phase when my both my name and my gender were incorrect based on who then came into the room. And all of this then impacted my general life and happiness. I was attempting to get a job so I could afford medical transition. So my inability to access employment created an inability to access uh, my medical transition and pretty much an inability to progress in my life. Um, so being able to get that one piece of paper, um, I don't think the, the the value of that is understood by a lot of my cis peers who are freely passing through life without ever considering what gender means on their pieces of paper. Um, the day after I got my gender recognition certificate, I also got my new uh, birth certificate, which allowed me to get a new passport, which meant that I could travel. I could go outside of the country without being immediately fearful that I would be stopped by, by border control. Equally, I was traveling to the US and I was able to obtain a visa and to pass through uh, the airport security and TSA relatively unfazed even through their ridiculous 3D body scanners. So I think I, I sort of mark my, my transition in the chapter of before I was able to do any of the paperwork, sort of the logistics of transition and afterwards. And afterwards, it's sort of just been running at full speed. Now the, the gender recognition certificate and all gender markers in my life are sort of background noise, which is a massive uh, relief. It's a privilege, obviously, as well. Um, it brings me a great source of pride and happiness to be able to display my pieces of paper and all of my correct letters on those pieces of paper. Um, it's really important for me as well that my um, my gender recognition certificate amends my birth certificate. I don't I didn't get a new birth certificate. It amended it to mean that I, I just changed it, which is important to me because it's one of those foundational documents of life. And it's also important that my birth certificate reflects my family's. Um, the birth certificates in Ireland change their format between the time of me being born and me getting my gender recognition certificate. The birth certificate that I have amended is the old version. So it still looks like all the ones that my, my family has. And again, that seems a little bit inconsequential. It seems a little bit insignificant, but it's sort of the symbolism of that piece of paper traveling with me and changing with me is uh, poetically important to me beyond the fact that it's just logistically vital to be able to live and to be able to gain employment to exist in all of these systems. Great, thank you. And speaking of pieces of paper, um, uh, birth certificates and IDs and all these sort of things, um, correct me if memory serves me correctly, Antonia, um, the process in Brazil, it takes quite long for you to receive the actual um, your your updated documents. Um, is it is it ninety days? So how long does it take for you to? So what's so once you've gone and you've you've um you've filed your your application to to have your your gender marker changed and your name changed, how long is the process and what are all the steps and the documents that you do receive? It depends a lot. For me, it was two months, I, I believe, but it can be three months or one month. It depends. If you are living the same city that you were born, or if you if you were born in a different state, the mm -hmm. process will take longer. Mm -hmm. um, and if you, if you were born in a small city, maybe maybe if it's very small, you need to travel to that city because mm -hmm. the civil registry is not connected to the central. I don't know something. So mm -hmm. in this case, I heard one person only needing to change about needing that needed to go to Bahia to take the documents. It can take, I don't know, how, how many months this person would take, would take to have money to travel to another right. state. Right. Um, but, but for yeah. me, it was pretty, like, two months, but that was okay. And as I said, I, Casa Chama connected me, connected me with a, a lawyer that online enter all the documents and I only needed to go to the civil registry one time to, to I need to remember that actually. No, I need I need to go two times to, yes. to sign and then to get the my birth certificate. That was very yeah, because, emotional moment. 
because look, look, looking at your law and um, it says um your birth certificate needs to be issued within 90 days now it's just sort of double checking to see that the process actually was working as they say it should work um there's a period the maximum period maybe right 90 days which is three months right um copy of a national civil identification document is that like an id document also mm -hmm. within 90 days um if applicable a passport yeah and your tax identification number um all those need to be done you you can get them within 90 days uh and copy of a voter id if applicable okay i was just sort of checking to see that the law was was working as i say it should work yeah mm. and but i'm very privileged think about the 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 voting for example because lots of trans people don't go voting because they don't the documents don't reflect who they are and they don't have this basic access to the democracy and if you don't vote in Brazil it's mandatory to vote and if you don't vote you need to, to go to the this justice or how can I say this, this the election court or something and okay I'm talking about talk about six months if you need to get ready all the documents if you don't if you don't you didn't vote in the in the, next, in the previous election for instance and you need to correct all these documents and you need to pay um, a fair. So lots of process depending of what you did before, if you have passport, another uh, thing to, to, to worry about. It sounds like there's still, like, still a lot of work to be done to- um... and That's why it's so hard to, to do this by yourself. You can do this. There's, there, there is Popa Trans which gives you all the links. is a project made by trans people that try to get to, to make things easier. But if you don't have access to internet, scholarly. It's yeah, and it's and it's much. important to know. It's important to note how 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 significant it is for for an ID doc so any form of of I of ID and how, what it's connected to so many things it's connected to your tax ID it's connected to your passport connected to your if you have a lease agreement if you in you know, all these sort of things and schooling um and those are those are the the ancillary um um things that people need to need to be aware of it's all well and good to go, oh, yes, I have a new ID, but then what does that mean practically as an individual? Uh, what does it mean for me to, to wake up in the morning and I have to go to the civil registry, I have to go to the ID place, I have to go to uh, my lease office and all these, you know, all these other authorities that we have to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, uh -huh. Right, so in as far as, as, as your message to the world and to what recommendations would you have for like other governments and activists and just people navigating through life? I will start with you, Oscar. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I think that the, the main piece that I have through through all of our work is from the perspective of governments and um, the legislation that we're writing and sort of the, the systems that we're putting into place. I think kindness is the most important part of this advocacy to understand the kindness of humanity and to ensure that the practices that you're implementing are kind and reasonable to the people that then have to engage with them creating a system of gender recognition that re-traumatizes people is not kind so if we're trying to create a world that allows for people to freely exist the element of how we're going about doing it is incredibly important from the activist perspective and from sort of the in-community perspective, I think it's really important to be steadfast in our belief of pushing forward with um, free legal gender recognition by self-determination. And more importantly, I think this is it's to ensure that when we manage to take that step individually, to not forget that there are people behind us. Um, in Ireland, that means that our non-binary community are behind us and they don't have what we have as a, non as a binary trans community. Our under 18s don't have the same protections and the same provisions. So I think it's important for the governments to be kind and it's important for the communities to uh, have solidarity and to have meaningful solidarity just because the system that's in place now works for you doesn't mean it works for the rest of our trans community and all of that then knocks on to the social the medical the everything else if we don't start with kindness and if we don't start with solidarity then it's not going to work powerful words oscar uh antonio 
Um, for governments, Ricky, I think governments, legislators, decision makers need to understand that this is an important agenda for trans diverse people, but the benefits are the impact of this kind of legislation is not just for us, the whole society somehow transitions when we have access to the basic rights that is our name. And uh, as we said before, we are talking about access to democracy, voting, employment, and everyone benefits if a community is not excluded systematically. Um, so I think we, we need to understand that it's not just a trans agenda, it's an agenda for the society because people are excluded right now. And when we access this right, lots of new opportunities open, not just for us, but for governments, schools, universities, companies, the whole society, the entire society. And for my com for our community, my community, I agree a lot with what, what with what Oscar said um, in terms of there are always people uh, somehow behind and we need to, to understand these intersectionalities um, in a big, very big country as Brazil. Geography is very important, um, but I wouldn't forget that the small steps are also important. So as I said, the social, the social name somehow prepare the, the land for this fertile moment of the decision of the Supreme Court in 2018. Um, and Dima Rousseff didn't do this because she was a nice president. She did this by the pressure of the social movement. And uh, I think there was a, a, a small step that made us ready to achieve big steps before. Thanks, Antonia. Do you have any questions before we wrap up? Uh, right, so I have a question from someone by the name of Nine. I'm interested, interested to know which countries with legal gender recognition make it available to non-citizens, whether this is restricted to certain categories of non-citizens and if it's not available to them, what efforts are being made to resolve this? Um, so Hazel has put something in the chat. So, yeah, so we do have something on our legal gender recognition web page. If you can click on, click on the link there. But I do know quite a few countries have, have it um, available to non-citizens. As a non-citizen of the United States, I was able to change my my um to have my gender marker and my name change um observed before I even became a permanent resident of the country. So I know uh, it it does exist. In as far as quantitative numbers, you'd have to um, please go onto our web page and you'll find more information on, on, on there. I'm not sure if that's the situation in Ireland and Brazil as well. Antonio. We do have, we have some provision for, for non-citizens. So anyone in Ireland who is registered with the uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs and Trade. So that would be someone who's a non-citizen who works in Ireland or someone who is ordinarily a resident in Ireland. So you can have a certain provision if you're not technically a citizen, but you do live here. And there's sort of a, a system where you can verify that you're a res re resident in Ireland. And that will mean that your gender recognition will apply for any Irish ID that you have, which then, I mean, there's a knock-on impact for if you then go back to, to a home country or a different country. The systems will obviously change, but there is provision. There are provisions in place for non-citizens in Ireland to, to access legal gender recognition through the same system. And in Brazil, yeah. I'm sorry, I I don't know how to answer. I'm not prepared to answer this this question. I need to do my homework. <laughs> no, that's fine. Uh, so there's a question from someone about: Are the organisations that support vulnerable individuals relocating to safety? Not that we know of. There are quite, you know, if you if you went if you googled and went on 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 online, I'm sure you could find some some organisations that would be able to help um, um, LGBTIQ people relocate. But the, but Rain, Rainbow Railroad is one. Oscar has just said uh, that's that's I think the major one in 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 um, in the world that that, that does this. So if you go onto their website, I'm sure you can 
see more information. Okay, any other questions? We have one more question, the Q&A. Any additional countries that are on the cusp of passing good LGR laws or are the viable path towards past passing new laws and policies? So currently, um, I wouldn't say that they're on the cusp, but we're looking um, very seriously at places like Vietnam. Um, we also are looking at places like where there, there is possibly, maybe, maybe not, um, we're looking at places like um, Botswana um, and Namibia. So countries where inroads have been made um, to some form of legal gender recognition by, by way of, of medicalized interventions, uh, we, we're looking at, 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 at those countries. Um, I think those come to mind immediately. And um, next question that we have is what are the most effective strategies for initiating and advancing advocacy efforts for legal gender recognition in countries where transgender individuals do not receive legal recognitions from the governments? So um, for this question from the anonymous attendee as to how best we can advocate for legal gender recognition, I would say it's we go back to the draw, drawing board of as activists yeah, and advocacy is is to is to seek out audiences with any any authorities that will listen to you. So start with your community leaders, uh, move on to your politicians, and if you are lucky enough to get to parliament, that's the avenue that you that you need to start. But I mean, start small um, at, at grassroots, and then go bigger, bigger, bigger. Okay, so I've been told we need to wrap up we're almost done um yes we have five minutes do you have any other questions no okay so in wrapping up i would just like to sort of um bring this conversation back um and by by summarizing and the i would say the most compelling reasons why governments should allow self-determined legal gender recognition can be summed up, summed up um, in three or four things. Respect for human rights is the first one. All individuals, regardless of who they are, what their identity is, have the rights to, to self-determination and the ability to live in alignment with their true selves. Um, by recognizing and respecting trans people's self-determined gender, gender is a crucial step towards upload upholding human rights principles. We also need to think of the mental health and well-being of individuals. And gender dysphoria is the distress which individuals experience whose gender identity differs from the assigned sex at birth. And it can have severe negative impacts on their mental health. Um, we've heard of many reports of the rate of suicide among trans individuals and among non-binary people. And this is one of the major facts is by having, having um, identity, doc identity documents that do not align with their, with their, with their um, self-expression. And by allowing self-determined legal gender recognition, it helps alleviate this distress by providing trans individuals with legal gender recognition that aligns with their true identity and it just reduces discrimination and improves their overall well-being. We also look at the reduction of discrimination. Legal gender recognition of a person's affirmed gender reduces the risk of discrimination in various areas such as employment, education, housing, and public services. It provides protection against harassment or mistreatment based on an individual's perceived incongruence between their appearance and their official documentation. Then we move to social inclusion and equality. By having self-determined legal gender recognition, it acknowledges trans people's identities as valid and equal to cisgender individuals. Um, it allows them to fully participate in society without fear of discrimination or exclusion based on inaccurate documentation. So, to conclude, I would say by allowing self-determined legal gender recognition, governments can foster a more inclusive society that respects the rights of identities of all individuals, regardless of their gender identity. Thank you.
And um, Hazel's just put something in the chat before we wrap up. Uh, we do have some um, frequently asked questions on our website around legal gender recognition, which I've paraphrased for uh, the sake of wrapping this discussion up. Before I leave, I'd like to thank my amazing panelists, Antonia and um, Oscar. Um, thank you for being on this webinar. Thank you for taking part in our campaign. Um, it is, it is, it's useful, it's informative, and re it really will go a long way in us helping achieving the objectives that we have set ourselves. And thanks to everyone who has tuned in to the webinar. Thanks to Neela. Thanks to our comms team for supporting this webinar. And have a good day wherever you are.